uh, the Peter Laux uh, lecture. The lecture, this is a main lecture that was established by the International Commission on the Water Resource System of the International Association of Technological Sciences. And uh, this is uh, the first lecture that is uh, uh, given today. And uh, this lecture will be delivered uh, in uh, any edition of the IHS International Symposium Symposium on Water Resources Management. And uh, in our intention, this will become a tradition. And the, le the lecture is given by scientists who provided uh, outstanding contribution to the field of water resources management and uh, both field of hydrology. The lecture, as we know, takes the name of Daniel Peter Laus, who is the leader, actually, the first Peter's, Peter's Laus lecture. And uh, Peter currently teaches and uh, directs research at the university in the development and application of economics, ecology, and systems analysis method for the solution of environmental problems. He authored uh, books that are considered masterpieces uh, in water resources management, and above all, he has a distinguished career as a professional, a consultant, and uh, a researcher. I think we can say that Peter probably doesn't agree with that, but uh, Peter was uh, one of the fathers of uh, water resources management because he assisted in the growth and the build and the growth of the field. And uh, especially the student wrote very well his books, uh, and in particular his masterpiece book that was published in 1981. Correct. And uh, therefore, it's uh, my great pleasure today to invite Pete Denver, the first Peter Lauch lecture. Because uh, before uh, you, you start, Pete, I just would like to remind all of you that uh, after the lecture, we have uh, the field trips, uh, and uh, the meeting point is uh, uh, here in the main entrance soon after the lecture. So please, uh, we are a bit late already now, don't, uh, uh, don't miss the appointment for the field trip. Pete, the floor is yours, and uh, already now, congratulations. Just one second, I switch. Uh, 
I come from a systems bias, so I'm going to attempt to develop a, a model, an optimization framework that, uh, that has this coupling reaction. And of course, it's conceptual because I, don't, I can't implement it. I don't know how. Okay, and I'll explain why. Uh, and then uh, I'll go through some uh, illustrative examples, many of which have been talked about already here. So it's, uh, it's a good step to do. And, uh, and do tell me when I'm getting close to time, because I don't want to go over. So, uh, so anyway, when I started uh, getting into water, okay, what you found in engineering anyway at the universities were courses in how to build a dam, okay, how to build a dam, and, uh, and how, to, how to design turbines. I never learned how to do that, but anyway, there were books on that. And, uh, and it was very, uh, you know, very discipline-oriented, hydrology, uh, hydraulics, sanitary engineering, which was the term in those days, instead of environmental engineering. Um, uh, it was all designed to meet human needs for energy, uh, for water supply, for usually local project oriented. Let's build a dam here, not thinking about the whole context, not thinking about the whole basin and how it all interrelated, but just this local project oriented. And, uh, and I don't think there was any really exposure in my career to the idea that maybe water could also be used to enhance the environment at that time. Okay? And this is in the uh, the 60s, okay, when I started getting into these walls. By the way, my background is forestry. I learned a lot about trees before I got into this. So, so that's my excuse for not knowing much about water. Uh, anyway, the people that were writing books in this area were Greg K. Lindsay, uh, the guy that wrote the water engineering book that had the <coughs> blueprints for dams. Uh, Dan Oaken was on the quality side. Um, Ben T. Chow in hydrology. Uh, Roy Beard on the far right is a famous hydrologist uh, that ran the Corps of Engineers Hydrology Engineering Center and was the president of everything you can imagine you could be in his career. <coughs> and I have that Dave Damon in there, but he's not so old. He's my age. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, these, are, these are the hydrologists. Uh, and uh, this, this, is, this is still alive and well, okay? People are still writing books on these subjects oriented to specific uh, topics in engineering. And, uh, and these are some of the recent books. And, uh, and one book you can download into your iPad, okay? Or whatever that is that you hold. Okay. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> but you can download that and then read it if you are bored <laughs> somewhere and read the text. Uh, so, and then came uh, the Harvard Water Program in the late 50s, and, and they produced a Bible, I call it, in 1962. And the Bible was called The Design of Water Resource Systems. And this was an attempt to see if the tools that were used in industry in, in, in World War II could be used, the modeling tools, the optimization and simulation tools, could be used uh, for uh, environmental and water purposes, okay? And so Harvard got together a lot of people from the government and a lot of academics and, uh, and produced a book on this. And this book really was the Bible. And it started a revolution. And I'm part of that. You know, I got involved in studying this stuff in 19, early 1960s. My advisor, according to uh, uh, gave me that book. Uh, I didn't read it at all. It was just Greek, okay? But, uh, but that's the problem. It's still a good read. It's still a good read. But this book was saying, hey, you know, you can do more than just design turbines and powerhouse. You, know, you, can, you can look at the social objectives and you can use these tools to integrate the economic, especially, and other social objectives into the analysis that you're going to use to decide how big to build something, where to put it, and when to build it, and how to operate it. Uh, that's what systems is about, okay? And uh, you can look at it from a whole river basin point of view, which they did. Um, so you can look at lots of different reservoirs, and lots of different diversions, and, and uh, 
treatment plants and so on. Uh, and, it, and it talked a little about using optimization and simulation models and algorithms. And by the way, uh, at Harvard, where they wrote this book, okay, they used the computer, all right? They used the computer. And I think the computer filled a room like this. And it had 32K of words. 32K of words. <laughs> Not killing it. 32 <laughs> and, uh, and they wrote a book and said, look what we can do. And it involved cards and holes in them. <clears throat> That's another story, okay. Um, but now we're, we're talking about more than that. Uh, we're talking about developing models. Oh, by the way, there was a real transition between putting a card deck into a computer and a few days later getting out an output that's all on paper, reading the paper. To when they decided that why do that? Why not just have it all on a computer screen? And there were a lot of people like me who resisted that because a lot of that. Uh, and now you don't even see paper. Uh, so they so the idea of developing interactive graphics based interfaces where the option now is to allow people, the stakeholders hopefully, to get involved in playing around with the models if not actually building them themselves. Uh, and that's you know, hopefully getting them to feel like they have some ownership in the tools that they're using, and some feeling that they work and you build them a testament. Uh, and uh, and this is the this is the deal of water source planning management. Now, you can't go anywhere without learning how to model it. You're going to be in planning management too, I think. You can't imagine what you'll do otherwise. Okay? Uh, so so uh, Okay, so this book, 1962, the main author was not an engineer, he was a government guy. Okay? That's a social science, by the way. Right? Uh, and the next two people you see on the side are Dork and Steve Hartland, and these are two, well, at that time, and Hartland's still alive, but uh, two economists. Okay, so the first three authors of this book were social science. And then came Harold Thomas. Okay, and Port Care, uh, and Harold Thomas was a very well-known hydrologist, and his uh, thing is incredible because he got to be a fellow of HEU, okay, when he never published a paper in HEU. Now, pull that off. <laughs> and, and what Harold did, I have to tell the story. Okay? I, I spent some time on it. And, uh, and Harold had all these incredible ideas and he put them on the shelf. And what happened when he retired is that his students, like Mike Hearing and Peter Rogers and others that were very famous, just kept feeding themselves with these papers of Harold Thomas. They were just copying Harold Thomas as well. Um, it, and I remember going in and saying, look at this fantastic moment. Look what I've done. It's a good thing. Thinking about getting rid of it. It's okay. And he said, yeah, I thought about that when I was in high school. And he goes to the, goes to the shelf and pulls out a paper. And it's, it's what I thought of. So, so, he, uh, so Harold Thomas is a big name, OK? Uh, that's not good. OK, so I'm sorry, guy. And there are two people that are still cooking, OK? Uh, Peter Rogers on the far right is uh, still at Harvard. I think he retired now. And, uh, Henry Jacoby, who I worked with mostly, was the director of the Harvard program until he got uh, turned down for tenure in economics at Harvard. And he then went to MIT in the business school. He said the best thing that ever happened to him was to get turned down at Harvard. Because he really he, I mean, he felt he was really much better off at MIT in the business school. Uh, so that's that, okay. And, and today this feels a lot, all right? There are textbooks being produced by lots of people here talking about these, uh, these techniques, okay? And not only that, people are actually making a living at doing this, okay? Which is important, all right? So these are two firms, uh, Hatch Engineers, as it used to be Acres, a Canadian firm that goes around the world, applying systems analysis to big data river basin projects. And, uh, and Dan Shear on the left uh, is another firm that uh, does a lot of work. Uh, and these guys have people they employ I can't forget this guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he also has a firm, makes a living doing this. Good living, I think. And, uh, so, and I would have put him.
Dave's picture on there, even if I wasn't here, okay? So, uh, and, and so, and then came, okay, then there was a little bit of a reaction, okay? There were, there were people that were concerned about, this is my history, okay? The people were about getting concerned about the fact that, that uh, NSF, which, which did a lot of funding for us, used to it, right? uh, uh, didn't think of hydrology as a, as a science. They thought it was in applied engineering. That's where most people learn their hydrology, in engineering. Course. And uh, in fact, that's a challenge book. It's called Applied Hydrology. Okay. And so there were people that really wanted to change that mentality and make hydrology a geoscience. Uh, and to do that, they went to be on the other extreme. They did away water resources research, they did away with the policy editor. Uh, at the beginning of water resources research, the big name editor was a policy company, the Congress. Uh, and, uh, and so they, they did a good job of sort of cleaning up hydrology and getting economics out of it and getting social parts out of it. And in order to make it a science, and they succeeded. They succeeded. They're the guys that, that I think are the instigators of it. And these are good guys, okay? These are good guys. Uh, they just they did a lot of damage, all right? Uh, they, uh, Peter Eagleson, uh, Nasir Rodriguez, uh, Hornberger, and uh, Clemish. And I remember, gosh, I was in a conference and I was giving a talk on uh, the, you know, <coughs> the use of. Uh, optimization in Nigeria for developing a, a scheme that they had there. And I had economics in the objective function. And Big Glenish was in charge of that conference. And he said, no, can't do it. Get out. And I thought, well, this is, come on, you guys. I'll let you do your water stuff. I don't interfere with you. You have a lot of people to think about other things besides just water. And, uh, but they, uh, they really had this goal of uh, cleaning up hydrology. And so for a long while, Water Resources Research became a groundwater modeling journal, I think. Mean. Uh, and that's when I dropped it, because I came out of reading that stuff. Uh, and, uh, but it's back now. It's back, OK? Uh, so, so now we're talking about social hydrology. But I gave you that history because we've been social, OK? We just got kicked out for a while. Let me say that, okay? <laughs> you agree? You agree? Okay. All right. All right. So anyway, people are back in some fashion, all right? Uh, a, and water Resource Research as a policy editor, and thanks to Alberto and Cooper and uh, lots of others, you know, we're, we're, there's a concern. Get, get people back into the hydrology, and that's, to me, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, uh, <clears throat> It's interdisciplinary, uh, and it's a dense understanding of a couple of more resources as well. Yeah, so let's talk about this couple, this attempt anyway, to uh, see if we can look at uh, explicitly not just the water system and its impact by having people make decisions about it, but also the other way around. You know, how, how does the state of the water system affect people? So it's my college. Okay, I'm going to quote a few things. Again, okay? uh, a new science that's aimed at understanding the dynamics and co-evolution of coupled human water systems, understanding interpretation, scenario development of flows and stocks, and human modified water cycle at multiple scales, including two-way feedbacks between human and water system, understanding dynamic cross-scale interactions and feedbacks between natural human processes that may give rise to <coughs> the water. The sustainability challenges that we face in the Anthropocene. Pretty good if you can write that stuff, right? Uh, lots of jargon. This is what I think it says. Understanding two-way feedbacks between human and water systems. That's what it is. If I had to boil that down to one sentence, so, uh, and uh, let's see if we can do that. I mean, so I'm going to try something, OK? But let's first talk about water in a broader context. Uh, Think of, can you guys think of anything that exists that you can see now or that you could see if you're in the somewhere uh, that doesn't require water? Everybody? 
everything that's in this room is carbon water, not just the wood because it had to grow, not just us. I mean, obviously, we were carbon water, but uh, the steel and the water that washes the beast, right? And the lights that we produce from the energy that you need water to do, right? and so on. So, uh, so the water, that, there, I think there's one thing that, that I can think of that may not need water, but that's it. Uh, maybe there's, you can think of some others, but water's a, a big deal. And so therefore, the UN's realized that it's not a sector. The UN wants to divide the economy of the world into sectors, and they're saying water is not a sector. Sanitation and water supply is a sector, but not water. Uh, and uh, it's in everything. And there's a lot of cultural and religious and uh, spiritual uh, aspects to it. It has these dimensions, religious, social, economic, Political, moral, legal. It's it's a it's a big deal. Okay? Uh, and the goals of uh, social hydrology is being sensitive to this. Uh, being sensitive to it. And if we're developing tools that are deciding and helping people inform them about what they might do, what the impacts might be, we should be aware that this water is a lot of dimensions besides just physical or just economic. So in other words, if we can if we can if we can understand better the relationships between human and water, uh, I think we can the hope is anyway that we can uh, understand better the changes in the social and political power structures and organizations. We can understand how new technologies get developed uh, and uh, new economic activities and so on. I went to a social uh, scientist uh, in preparing for this, and I said, uh, you guys have disciplines to deal with water? And uh, I came, they came up with these three, okay? Uh, there's ecological anthropology, and they claim, the one I talked to anyway, the interactions between ecology and culture uh, systems. Uh, Hydrosociology, uh, between hydrology and cultural systems. Uh, and then there's the computational social, social science where they're actually trying to quantify uh, relationships. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that's that. So I'm going to now go through building a conceptual model for me. All right? This is, me. This is where I think you guys can find it. Still need to go out of the door, okay? Uh, but let's call this the water system. All right? Whatever it is. And that's a big one, okay, a lot of purposes, okay? And uh, let's call that the social system, all right? Stakeholders sitting around the table deciding what to do. So those are my cartoons, okay? Uh, and, uh, and what we are interested in, obviously, is the influence of the social system on the water system. So in other words, uh, uh, these guys are deciding, based on the state of this system, that what they got to do is do something, okay? Build a levy or whatever. And, uh, or clean up the water quality or whatever. So that's the connection in this direction, okay? And, and then we're interested also in the connection the other way. Given the state of the water system, how is that going to affect the social system? How is that going to affect these people sitting around the table? And then what are they going to do? And that will be the challenge. That will be the challenge of us to do that, okay? So this is a couple, couple of interaction that, we, that we're going to try and model, okay? And see the you know and company uh, you know said welcome to social hydrology the science of people in water. Uh, and it's a good one. It's got us thinking, right? It's got us thinking. And here are the bad guys. Uh, so uh, and might have that article. Uh, so lots of people, if you go to Google and, and looking at the conceptual diagrams, you'll find a lot that link a bubble that's water and a bubble that's social and a few other bubbles. Okay. And, uh, and and there are a lot of these. Uh, and and uh, the one that's, that's really heroic, and uh, the, the people that deserve a medal for this for the audience, okay, uh, is this one that you may have seen, where actually they put things together quantitatively and then simulated and simulated what they call politics and technology and society and economy. And that's, that's impressive. And it's out of that, it's out of this, uh, this, this report here. Okay. And 
there are these guys. Okay. And all the one is in the audience. So, that's my view. Okay. If you don't try it, you're never going to succeed. Right? So, no guts in the board. Go uh, your diagrams and see what you can do. Okay, so here's my, here's my attention. Yeah, okay. Let's look at the social system and the water system, all right? Uh, and what ha this is my feeling of what really happens in the world, okay? Uh, social system decides to do something, and they make decisions, and these decisions affect the water system. And, uh, and that's what's shown here, all right? Uh, but those, and, and they do it thinking that they know what's going to happen. But it doesn't always happen that way, okay? Uh, there, there's some unintended results. And so this lady, you see a ball, you know, okay? Good, surprise, surprise, okay? Uh, something happened that they, don't, they didn't anticipate. Uh, and, uh, and so what that does in, in my real world situation is that it, it's caused a little reaction by the people. They don't like it, okay? They don't like it. So they protest. Uh, and that, and that rea it's people's reaction gets fed back into the social system, okay? Uh, and they're saying, help, you know, this is not good, this is not good, help, no, political pressure. And then what happens? Okay, the social system gets busy and working in, and they make another decision, okay? And they react to that pressure, okay? And their impacts, and then so, keep going, okay, keep going. That's what I think really happens. Uh, and, uh, and so let's uh, let's see let's see if I can put some pretend that I'm on the table, okay? Let's see what I can do. Let's let let's let x, the vector x, represent everything you can imagine that you know about that water system. Everything. It's they're measurable, okay? You can go there and look and see. What you so this is the state of the water system. And very this is very conceptual, okay? Uh, and that state gets fed into the social system, okay? And then the social system decides if they're going to do anything about that state, okay? And if they do, then they want to take action, okay? And let Z be the vector of the action that they take. So all the decisions they make that affect the water system is represented by the vector Z. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and they do it thinking, okay, if we make this decision Z, we would expect to have an outcome in the next time period, whatever that is, time is going to be variable, okay, of uh, x t plus 1, okay. And, and, and so here's my model. Here's, here's where I go. Okay, so what they're doing is they're maximizing something. I don't know what they're maximizing, okay? I'll call it net utility. And every time the economist tells me about utility, I'm saying, come on, get it. But uh, so I'll call it utility. It's not just economics, it's utility. Okay? And, uh, and so they, uh, they're maximizing some utility that they have that a function of the expected value of the x that they think they're going to get in the next time period. Okay? Now, the decisions they make are based on, uh, on this d is the decision uh, part of the model. Okay? Uh, the decision is based on the state that they're in now, okay? And everything else you can think of, that finally is everything else. <laughs> Other constraints, uh, possibly, okay? Uh, and I don't know what that is either, okay? But uh, if we did, we might have a better idea of what the Z is going to do, okay? Uh, and, uh, and then we have a transition function that takes the decision and the state and converts it to an expected value. X T plus one. Okay? Uh, and uh, and one, okay? And then they so they make that decision. Uh, and it goes over here, okay? Uh, and then uh, all right, so but what really happens is that this is not an expected value anymore. This transition is making the decision and the state that it was in, and this component, this random component that would give you a surprise. Uh, and that gives a 
is the actual state, okay? And that actual state then feeds back into the social system. That's my, that's my conceptual model. So here, here's the way I would look at it and then I'd try to find a way to solve it, okay? I'm going to maximize over all the time periods, whatever they are. Uh, this, uh, this net utility, <coughs> Discounted, okay, um, and I have my decision uh, vector, and I have uh, I have uh, this transition function, okay, and this is my job to do that. Now that's crazy. That's crazy because what really happens in the world is that nobody makes a decision based on what they think's going to happen 20 years from now and puts it in the moment today and looks at it later. They they're thinking about what it is they're going to do next, okay. So this is one more adaptive approach where you're saying, I'm just going to look at the next period. And I'm going to maximize the utility that I hope to get out of my expected value for the next period. Not all the others, okay? With the same algebra down here. Okay. Same algebra. Now, roll your eyes, okay? This is the way I think. This is the way you think. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and it's a way to get started in anyway, doing this. What's frustrating? What's frustrating about this whole systems area, in my view, is that um, we can analyze anything to death, but we have to think about it first. We have to include the options that we're looking at in the models that we're going to Our models aren't able to synthesize. Our models aren't able to say, wow, you forgot to think about these calculations. If you didn't have it in the model, there's nothing to tell you you should think about, uh, or whatever, okay? So we're not synthesizing. And boy, if any of you guys can learn how to synthesize, you got to know that problem, okay? That's a good one. How to make these models create new ideas, you know, new things. Uh, and uh, so, but it's not, it's not hopeless, and it's hopeless in my generation, but it's not hopeless in general, okay? Uh, the, uh, as I was preparing this, okay, uh, you know, I'll go without my yellow on this mic. Um, as I was preparing this, here's the New York Times, personal technology is called, and it's an, an article about contextual computing. What's that? It's computing that reads your mind before you know it. Okay. It's thinking ahead of you, and it's in your app. It's in the app, in a, in a, in a cell phone, or whatever it is you guys carry around. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and, it's, and there's a market for it, okay? Uh, and so maybe the other thing to think about, too, is that a lot of effort is going into robots, okay? And a lot of computer scientists are developing software to make robots behave the way they want to, okay? And robots are supposed to eventually help us at home, turn on the lights, coaster, whatever it is, right? And they have to think ahead. And so, uh, so I don't think it's a hopeless cause uh, to think that eventually somebody may actually do something like a little bit of synthesis. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so this uh, contextual aware computing market um, is uh, growing at a C A G R speed growth rate or something. Okay, at 32.35.2 percent to reach 120 billion by 2018. Hey guys, get into it. Okay, <laughs> it's uh, it's not just a fly by ants. Uh, and uh, so this is contextual computing up here. This is what they're, they're Here's a post written about how to program robots. Okay. So, uh, who knows, who knows, who knows, okay. Now, let me just uh, briefly look at this from a modeling, a little bit more of a modeling perspective. Okay. Here's the water, here's the social. Okay. And if you look at this, this is sort of the constraint set uh, in some way political boundaries, economic, social, physical. Uh, this, these are constraints that. Uh, that Live with and, uh, and put that underneath this uh, this dimensional area. And here's the objective value. Right? This is the uh, net utility uh, that, that you're trying to uh, maximize. Okay. Uh, and uh, 
And so you have a model like this and it's working okay. And the difficulty is that what you see in red, you don't know. Okay, you don't know the you don't know the net utility function. I don't know anyway. Okay. I don't know what D is. I have no idea how to do that. Okay. And uh, and this random component up here is also uh, that's the thing that invents new ideas, okay? And, and makes you surprised. So, so that's the that's the challenge. That's the challenge that we have. Okay. I want to go through a few case studies. And how many on time? Let's uh, <coughs> so uh, five minutes. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. A lot of these case studies were already mentioned in this, uh, in this meeting. So this is good. Okay. Uh, pollution spills. Uh, Recently, in the southeastern part of the United States, we've had two events where a lot of pollution died in the uh, And uh, you'd expect, and a lot of people have to buy bottled water, okay? And you'd expect that, uh, that there would be an outcry of saying, let's, let's clean up our act, okay? But not so. I mean, this is part of work. Okay? Uh, that kind of development really serious. And, uh, and Duke Energy puts a lot of money in the stream, okay? Uh, they also put a lot of money into the pockets of the politicians and allow them to do that, okay? And, uh, and maybe with hindsight, you say, yeah, that's possible. You should have predicted that. But it, it's not always that way. <clears throat> this was a case where some really bad carcinogenic uh, chemicals led into a large supply of spectrum. West Virginia is another state where, where uh, the environment is not on the top of the list. The Hudson River is a river that flows into New York City from upstate uh, in the United States, and it used to be pretty bad in terms of pollution. It still has some problems. But the, uh, but the, and this is where the airplane landed for people to have. Anyway, it took, uh, it took a public uh, reaction due to a folk singer that's famous, Pete Seeger, uh, that uh, was concerned about the environment and sang along the songs and uh, he generated a lot of support for cleaning up the Hudson and actually built a boat where they uh, sail up and down the Hudson you know, uh, to highlight the need for cleaning up the water. Okay. Uh, another example that's, that had this these are examples that, that weren't all predictable, okay? Uh, recently, uh, we've had some big floods in the United States, and uh, like you guys had some big floods. And, uh, but we have flood insurance, okay? And this flood insurance is subsidized by the government. And right now, uh, the flood insurance is $24 billion a debt. So the flood insurance program is paid out $24 billion uh, and so, uh, two years ago, Congress, our Congress, actually passed the law. And that's the fact in itself. Nobody would have predicted that in today's world, okay, in the United States, in our Congress. But, uh, but they actually, the Democrats and Republicans got together and got this law passed, where, and the president signed it, where subsidy would end. And everybody was happy that people like us were happy because people, we think, us and us, I think, People that want to live on a floodplain and live on the coast and live in the forest and the and live on the great falls, they take the risk. And if, if, if they get hurt, they should pay. Why should the tax pay? <coughs> so we were happy. Okay. And, uh, and the Tea Party was happy. The Tea Party in our country is the
paying subsidizing for jobs. That's a little bit of a that. So, um, we heard a lot about today, and it's a, it's a beautiful case. I think California is similar to that. Uh, Santa Barbara, uh, California, big drought right now. They had a drought in the past, but it was mentioned this morning, and, uh, and they were building a desalinization plant, and the plant got, as soon as it got built, the, the rains came. That's a truism. Build a plant and rings it up, and uh, so they never used the plant, and it's ready for use. But the computer systems in that plant, for example, the last time they were on, it was 1990. You can imagine what they have to do there. And uh, the membranes are no longer any good, and they have to find new membranes. So it's going to be a big job to get that plant up and running. But in the meantime, what do the people do? Okay, they are restricted in water use, and so these Santa Barbara, by the way, is a place where a lot of rich people. So, and they're not allowed to water the grass, and they really want green lawns. So they, there's a contractor that sprays lawns green, okay? So this guy's painting dead grass <laughs> And this guy's, I like that picture, man. That was the this talk, okay? Gibraltar, <laughs> <laughs> Gibraltar, you don't know where Gibraltar is. So, okay, Gibraltar is a, a an area that doesn't rain very much. Mm -hmm. People are there and they need water. So what would you think they would do to get water? Mm -hmm. Anybody been to the Gulf? What do you think they, they do to get water? Well, you think two things. Desalinization, right? Or sort of trucking or shipping. Right? And they've done that, right? But the other thing they've done is that on the side that you don't see a picture of ever, they poured concrete. And the idea is that water that does rain, rains on this concrete, runs down the concrete, goes into ditches, and then, and then goes into tanks. And that's how we get the water. You're going to see pretty pictures of the revolver. You don't see that side of it as well. You see the other side. And, uh, and then there are a number of places where lakes like the Oral City and this is in Iran, uh, uh, drying up because uh, the water being fed into these lakes. So the ecosystems are being destroyed. And, uh, and in Iran, they love to build dams in Iran. And uh, they were building dams to, to get water from other basins that they were going to transfer into these lakes. Into this lake. uh, and uh, who's from Iran? Privatization is another case study, all right? Uh, why doesn't it work in some places and it apparently doesn't work in other places, okay? Uh, why does it work in England? And how is England different than in Bolivia? Uh, usually there's a big reaction against privatization. Uh, I don't have time to go into too much of that, but that's, a, that's another story. And the transboundary issues, we talked about the Nile already. This is the NACOM and uh, Right now, the Mekong is under stress because, at least potentially, because uh, there's no war there, and that means that people can pour concrete and uh, not get hurt. And, uh, and so there are a lot of people pouring a lot of concrete there. Okay? And that's going to affect the biodiversity of the world's second most biodiverse area in the world. Okay? Uh, Amazon being the one. And uh, so there's, a, there's stories there, too. Florida. Florida Everglades. Yeah, this illustrates what was talked about this morning, uh, where after World War II, the objective was to drain a swamp. This is a whole swampy area in southern Florida. And uh, let's drain this area because Florida is nice, it's warm in the winter, and it's uh, really nice for recreation and whatever. Okay? And so they Congress allocated a lot of money for the Corps of Engineers to straighten up all the rivers and to build a lot of canals and uh, and shovel the water out to the ocean instead of 
through the Everglades with no concern about the environment because they didn't, they didn't care. They didn't even consider that. Uh, today we do. So our objectives change. And when our objective changes, sure, there was needs for adjustment. It's not that we did it wrong before, we just never had that as an objective. And now we do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in the airplanes, it's a it's a special place if you haven't been there before. Quickly, Yemen. Uh, Yemen. You know what that plane is, anyway? Oh, yeah. yeah. And that needs social economists 
that work with us and explain us the reaction of these uh, our you know actions on the psychological and, and uh, uh, reaction. But a lot of this, a lot of politicians make decisions that are not always anything to do with this. Okay? Yeah. And yet they affect this. But they want somebody else to vote for them on some other issue, right? So it's really that that focus smiley thing in the in you is really tough. It's really tough. And I don't think you can just go ask somebody what they want. Please uh fascinating talk on the learning from your fifty years of experience and especially terms of, sort of going around the full circle in terms of, sort of water systems engineering um, to sort of, you know, hydrology is more of a geoscience and then where we are at the moment. Um, but I think slightly critical and to stimulate you a bit more, um, where a lot of that water systems engineering and the perspectives that you provided were very much focused on what came out of the Second World War, like Jay Forrester and the systems dynamics approaches. But that whole area of systems based approaches has been shown quite a lot, and especially during the 70s. You know, so, you know, the checks on them, that's quite a backlash against the optimization based on structures and how they are a bit more of the social. Um, do you have any views on that? And um, what we can learn from um, some of those um, approaches of bringing in a bit more of the social to some of the more hard sort of systems. Bringing in more social in place of what? Well, well, if you look at some of the work, you know, Jay Boris and others, yeah. and sort of the whole systems dynamics literature, where they started off having quite a sort of, yes, there was sort of socialism there, but it was still very much optimization based. And then people like um, Peter Checkland came along and said that the, the, there isn't just one simple model structure. You have to sort of understand these different conceptual models, these different narratives. You know, you had a number of people sat around that table, so you don't just have that one conceptual model potentially, and how you take that into account, and how we need to bear that in mind in terms of the science of the how, if I interpret your question like right, how do we make sure that our models are complete? Yeah, no. Well, maybe not necessarily complete, because yeah. our own models are wrong. Uh, They're all wrong. That's right. That's trying to make them really useful. Yes. Yeah. Am I not? What you're reminding me of isn't quite what you're asking, but uh, there are people that are really urgent to the idea of optimization. And, uh, and I, and then the question is, what's success? What's success in the work that we do? Uh, and I feel that uh, if you're look, if you're thinking that you, there's a way somehow that you're going to be able to compete, to be able to develop an optimization policy uh, that's going to spit out an optimal solution, okay, of course. And if that's if that's not implemented, then that was a failure. I say no, no, no. You're asking too much. Way too much. These models. They're all wrong. And what they do provide is information. And and there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that information. And so my feeling is that the, that the work that I do, if I see it being debated in the process of making decisions, in the political process, it can be rejected, okay. But at least it's in there and they're thinking about it and they're considering it. Um, or they at least know that they don't want to do that. That's, that's what I call success. Um, and that's not what you asked. <laughs> but, uh, but it's not, uh, we should never think that, uh, that uh, what comes out of a computer not be able to stop. We have one more question. And uh, make sure we have one more question. Yeah, just so I can't explore the crystal ball. I think some of the things we actually know are going to happen. We know that our population is going to grow. We know we're going to get 8 billion people. We know that it keeps going. We get to some point where we can't feed people. We know these things are going to happen. In terms of climate change, we're going to certainly know. We have some certainty about things are going to happen. We just don't know why and when. So in terms of some of those scenarios, in terms of crystal ball set, I mean, I think at the real small level, we don't quite know what, what, what people will react. But if we go far enough out in time, we know we have to react. We know we have to do something, because otherwise people won't survive. And so we know that 
the, the, the short scale, there's a whole host of political argy bargy, but in, at the longer scale, we know that we have to do something, and we can, we can stare into that crystal ball. And one of the big mistakes we make now is not looking that far ahead, because the problem is, is that when you get there, you might be able, able not to do it in the past.